I was born in the year 1840, April 23rd, on a farm. It has all my life been known as the Raphael Marshall Farm. I do not know for how many years my father owned this farm, but he sold it to Mr. Marshall and his bride in 1840. It was February 1840 that my father bought the farm now known as Jennings Place. The farm of 300 acres was a dense forest at the time. But the land was cleared, and a frame house of one and one-half stories was built. When I was two and a few months old, I came to this new home. When I became of age to go to school, it was to the district school I went. The schoolhouse was down by the river. It has all so changed now. Back then there was no railroad nor railroad bridge. But the years in that first school were joyous ones. It was there that I learned to read, and afterwards went on with writing, spelling, geography, and arithmetic. The latter I did not like very much, though I shall never forget when my mind and brain opened to the understanding of long division. When I was about 12, I went for a year to the Painesville Academy. Then, in the winter of 1855 and 56, I was a pupil at Willoughby Female Seminary. It was during that winter term that the seminary building burned. My class finished the term studying in our rooms and reciting in rooms in the boarding hall down on the main street of the village. While in Willoughby, I boarded with Mr. and Mrs. Lord Sterling, who kept a house full of girls. And we all loved Pa and Ma Sterling, as they were called by the girls who lived with them. As some of you may know, it was after the burning of the Willoughby Seminary that the school was moved to Painesville, Ohio and renamed Lake Erie Female Seminary. You know it as Lake Erie College. Well, it wasn't long after my time at the seminary that I met my Jack. He was employed as a contractor on the Ohio Railroad being built very near my home. Well, on the 14th of October, 1857, we were married. Now, some of you may be saying, now wait a moment, aren't you a suffragist? A feminist? A woman lobbying for the truth that she does not need a man to survive? Well, may I remind you that I was not a suffragist at 17, and I fancied myself fallen in love. And Jack was a romantic sort of man. Our marriage was good, though it was hard throughout those years of the Civil War. It was hard during all those years he was off working on the railroad. He wrote to me often of how much he missed me and longed to be home, and I wrote him back telling him about our boys whom he barely knew. And even though I was left to tend to the children and to the farm on my own, Jack never doubted my capability for a moment. In fact, he took to calling me Frank instead of Francis, his reasons being that I was doing all of his work as well as my own, therefore I should have a man's name too. But you're not interested in the details of my pleasant little childhood or my marriage. You're interested in what I did for this country. More importantly, what I did for the women of this country. Well, there was a time when Jack and I moved out west to the state of Wyoming. There I met Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And that's where it all began. Jack and I moved back to Painesville in 1870 and my father built us our large brick home just a few miles east of the seminary. From there, I continued to involve myself in the women's rights cause. Some years later, on the 30th of November, 1883, myself and 20 other Painesville women gathered at the home of Mrs. Cornelia Sweezy, and we declared the establishment of the Painesville Equal Rights Association, or ERA, as we called it. I was declared president. We were careful in the respect of not adding the term woman or suffrage into the name of our organization for fear of it becoming obnoxious. Although our name fit our little group quite well even without the use of those two aforementioned words. You see, the purpose of our society was not just to gain suffrage for women, but also to educate our members on their rights and duties of citizenship and to discuss the day's political questions. We did have men in our midst, although we denied them admittance to the first few meetings, 
out of want to establish ourselves first without their advice. After that first meeting, we declared to have meetings every Saturday following and agreed to draft a constitution by our next gathering. The first few months following the founding of our organization were filled with new information and new emotions on the subject of women's suffrage. I remember being absolutely astonished at the amount of reading material that already existed on the matter. In fact, it was more than I could read, even if I took time each day to read one or two periodicals. I do regret to remember, even though I know now that our cause was a good and worthy one, that in those early days I was anxious that something should be said or done in public by one of our members that should be considered improper, and that our group would be discredited as a result. But as the years went on, I grew bolder and more unashamed. On the 14th of January, 1884, a new outlet was established to allow women to gather and talk of other educated matters. We called them parlor talks. And at the first, which 30 women attended, Miss Louise Randolph gave the first of a series of talks on Rome. We did not so much use the parlor talks to discuss suffrage related matters, but other more exotic subjects. And so we continue to have our parlor talks and our association meetings. That same January, we gathered to listen to a parlor talk held in the chapel of my alma mater. And by the 24th of May, 1884, we were granted permission to hold our first ERA meeting in the Painesville City Hall. It was at that meeting that Mrs. Marshall spoke her opinion on the unfair treatment of widows regarding property rights. Well, our ERA continued to grow. Over the years, we reached 200 members. As a group and as individuals, we began to meet other supporters of women's suffrage. This led to various invitations to attend special meetings and otherwise. I myself was invited to call upon Betsy Mix Coles, a suffragist, at her home in February of 84. Then, in that May, our ladies numbering 13 were invited to attend a special meeting held by the Western Reserve Council in Cleveland. It was at this meeting that I had my first encounter with a woman who was opposed to the idea of women's suffrage. Her name was Mrs. Airy, and she was a very educated woman, who, after hearing a pro-suffrage paper by Miss Minnie Clayton, stated that she strongly opposed the idea. Well, late that June, we gathered to celebrate the 25th anniversary of our beloved Lake Erie Seminary. Although amidst all the festivities, I was left with a sour taste in my mouth after hearing the celebratory address by Dr. Scoville of Western University. Imagine the nerve that man had to come to a female seminary and talk of why women did not require the right to vote. Well, Throughout the rest of that year, our ERA made leaps and bounds. Myself and the other ladies from the group assisted in keeping Adelbert College open to women. Two more organizations grew out of ours, one at Mentor and one at Kirtland. It was at one of the Kirtland meetings that I gave my very first speech. Well, I am not a talker and cannot give a speech, but after that first essay, more speeches followed. I was invited to the 16th annual American Women's Suffrage Convention in the wild western city of Chicago. There, I gave a short report on our situation in Ohio on the 20th of November. I enjoyed that convention more than I can say, but 1884 had to come to a close, and on the 7th of December, the ERA celebrated its first anniversary. I had the honor of delivering the opening address. Oh, but I've forgotten one of the most exciting things. In November of 84, Susan B. Anthony came to stay at Painesville. She spoke in conjunction with the ERA at the Methodist Church on November 13th. 
The church was filled, despite the admittance fee of 25 cents. And later that afternoon, many ladies called on her. Afterwards, Jack and I had the pleasure of having Miss Anthony for supper at Jennings' place. I declare, she was a delightful woman. Well, that supper began the years of close friendship between Miss Anthony and myself. There were many letters between us and some other visits to Painesville over the next few decades. Jack and I did have the privilege of putting her up in Jennings' place at least once. Susan was always generous in her offers to send me copies of books she had written. I still have this one letter from her, which she wrote on December 19, 1903, shortly after I had received one of her books. She wrote to me saying that I could be expecting another, and of what she wished me to do with it. She wrote, Now I have put up a set of The Life and Work, and a leather copy of The History of Women's Suffrage. Now, my dear, you must not return that cloth copy, but keep it on loan for everybody. If you will read the book, you will see that it answers every question that anybody can possibly ask about the suffrage movement. She continued, It will be nice for you to have it to loan as you wish, or if you want to put it in the library. Send for volumes one, two, and three in cloth to go with it, and you shall have them. In that same letter, Susan informed me that dear Miss Stanton had gone over the big river and that she, Susan, was one of the oldest left on this side. Well, soon enough, Susan went over the river as well, three years after that letter. But the death of my friend and fellow suffragette did not put a stop to my efforts for the suffrage movement. I still have years ahead of me. In February 1907, Jack and I were made life members of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Later, Miss Vivian Blanche Small invited me to come to the seminary and talk to the girls on the subject of women's suffrage. Well, I told them about my upbringing and how I came to be involved in the suffrage movement. I spoke to them about our ERA and the difference that we had made. I reminded them of all the strong women who had spent the best years of their lives fighting the battle for equal rights. And, well, perhaps I'll just read some excerpts for you. We organized a society known for years as the Equal Rights Association of Painesville. We tried to inform ourselves about the laws of Ohio concerning women and children. We found some that were bad. They were made by our fathers, brothers, and sons, and we must abide by them. We did think that our lawmakers were sometimes very thoughtless and careless, and did not realize the responsibility that was theirs. We did the only thing open to us. We petitioned for the change of certain laws. Yards of petitions from Ohio women went to the legislature, but received little notice although after a while there came a change in some important laws. And once we did get a bill introduced, asking that the Constitution be so amended as to give the women of Ohio the ballot. One state convention was held here, and we had very many interesting meetings. There were grand, great women who were constantly at work, never tiring and always hopeful. Those pioneer women, to whom every woman Every young woman owes a debt of gratitude, for they blazed the way and made possible so many of the privileges which are ours today. Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and of course our standard bearer, Susan B. Anthony. And on this occasion, may I add myself to that list. I left the young women at the college with the following lines and I leave you with the same. The work has been carried forward and is being carried on by women who loved Miss Anthony. Women like myself. Women's suffrage has a history, a history of many years of earnest work. <laughs>